what would happen if your business was suddenly hit with a $40,000 fine or even a $5,000 fine? No one wants to be hit with a fine to the IRS. I don't even want to pay them for my taxes, let alone for something that could have been prevented. In today's episode, CEO, we are talking all about contractors versus employees. And while we have covered this on this show before, trust me that you're going to want to tune in hot to today's episode where I'm talking with Kira LaForgia from The Paradigm Group. And we're talking all about why, the why behind why you need to have employees versus contractors, how to know exactly who should be classified as an employee and who should be classified as a contractor. And she's gonna be telling us some stories about her own clients as well and what they've gone through when staff has been misclassified. I cannot wait for you to dig into today's episode with me and Kira LaForgia. Okay, Kira, I cannot wait to talk today all about probably a topic that most of our listeners don't really wanna talk about, but that they need to talk about. So thank you so much for coming on the show and braving this topic. Yeah, I mean, I'm just so grateful to be here. I know we kind of riffed a little bit before we started, but I think this is going to be such a good way to introduce your audience to this really serious topic, but hopefully put a positive spin on it. That's right. Like, we are going to have so much fun. I swear, Kira and I just really met online, but we've already been like, we could just sit here and talk forever. And this topic, we're going to make it fun, you guys. We're going to make it fun. Kira, before we really kind of like press into that topic, Just tell everybody a little bit about kind of how you even got into this. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Um, well, unfortunately, I have been doing small business operations and HR for almost 13 years um, and just translated over to the consulting space and COVID. So I always called it like, and this is not being insensitive to what actually happened during COVID. I understand that was not good. It was like my, the first time I've had a break in years. Like I literally, it felt like summer break. I read a hundred books that year. I had a little floaty in my backyard that I would just sit on all day. Like I truly like let this business sort of flourish within that rest. So I think that for many of us, like when we have a professional career for so long in quote unquote corporate, because the small businesses I work for are generally, you know, in corporate or in my history are like 50 employees, multiple locations. They're not like our smaller operations that we're going to probably talk more to today and who Paradigm, my company, Mm -hmm. serves. Um, But yeah, and it all came out of, I've always wanted to be a consultant. I got a mentor about 11 years ago to help me guide, guide me in that direction. And then it really lit a fire under me when I got diagnosed with PTSD from burnout, from not delegating to team members. So that's a whole story. And I want to make sure we're focused on the value that your listeners are going to get today. But it really did kind of light the fire under me when I had the time to really process what it would look like to start a consulting business, lean into helping female founders and creatives, and help them see that delegation and the correct way to build a team is a game changer, not only for your mental health, but also for like having a business that is sustainable and doesn't make you want to give up every six months. (laughs) Yes, it's so you're like speaking the language of so many of my listeners. I know that there's people out there right now who are listening that just press their AirPods in a little bit harder (laughs) because they're like, I need to dial into this. And as you probably know, especially in the wedding industry, you know, we are service based. Like our heart is a servant's heart. So many of the people in the wedding industry get into it because you're like, I want to be part of somebody's biggest day. I want to serve them. I want to see them so happy. And oftentimes that can kind of spill over into the way we run our business where we think we're the only ones who can do it. We're the ones who will do it the best. We're the only ones who can serve the client. And you really kind of break those boundaries down. So hearing you say that you experienced that burnout, can you touch on the surface of how you see that translating into so many small business owners? Why do you think that so many of us kind of get to that place? Yeah. And I mean, I want to just say that like I talk about this a lot, so it might sound like rehearsed or, you know, not genuine. So I want to just really clarify that getting diagnosed with PTSD from burnout, from something I didn't even know that I had, and the result in the kind of trigger point of where it came from was not something to joke about. And so I think that while I like to kind of like make a little bit light of it, because I think you can always like turn something negative into a positive. And of course, we've, you know, we have a bunch of business owners here, we're honing in on our messaging, like, what are we doing? You know, all of that. 
that. But I think that it is really important to also recognize that it might sound like I might be just leveraging this experience I had, but really it is still something I struggle with. And so Mm -hmm. when I create content, even though it is kind of, I always say, I'm a consultant, I'm not a coach, I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to, I have no idea how to finesse you into these decisions. Like, I'm literally going to say, you have to do this. Like, that's literally what's going to help you. Um, And so it can come off a little bit like direct in that way. And I think that it really does just come from a place of like, I still am suffering the repercussions of that PTSD. There are still ways that I have to keep myself in check, run my business, run my team, manage my team. The same struggles that our clients have, I have. I have to hire all the time too. People are unpredictable. That's why HR is a permanent fixture. Like that is the way that we have to, you know, function. So I think that for many, for many reasons, it's not from a lecturing place, but it's just like, I felt like this two weeks ago when one of my Mm -hmm. teams was struggling and I wasn't getting the results that I wanted and I couldn't figure out how to communicate with them. And I deeply care about them as people. So it draws in those boundaries that you're talking about with those wedding bros. And then for, you know, having to do that both ways with, I'm really solid and straightforward with our clients, but it is hard to do that on the internal side. And so I think for wedding pros and other really like coaches and there, we work with therapists and mental health practitioners, like you're getting it from both sides. Like you have to figure out how to create a bubble around yourself that is going to keep you going so that you can make the biggest impact. And so kind of in a weird direction, I think that it's one of the biggest skills you can learn is how to delegate and build a team so that you can fully show up for your clients in the way that you want to. But I'm sure that you have other episodes on building boundaries with clients. So I'll let them listen to those, but it does go both ways. And you can very easily find yourself as like a Gumby in between getting pulled in several directions and that usually doesn't end well at least it didn't for me yeah no I I 100% agree and one of the things we talk about so much on this show I know you do as well is really the importance of building a team if if you want to stay a solopreneur I I try to at this point I've gotten to the point where I just tell people I'm not the right coach for you like it I'm never Mm going to teach you how to build a business as a solopreneur I I don't agree with it I don't think it's healthy and teach his own right like that's great if that's what you're doing and you feel confident in it go for it sister I'm not the right coach for you. But with that is really helping people to understand how to build that team, both legally and in a way that is going to serve you long term. And we were kind of talking before the show, you know, I feel like sometimes I'm beating my head against a wall trying to (laughs) explain. So I love that you said I'm a consultant, not a coach, because I can tell you what to do. But, you know, I'm not going to coerce you into doing it. Like, I'm just going to say black Mm. and white. This is what you need to do. Um, mm. I, I am a coach. And so sometimes I struggle with the fact that I look at my students and I'll just be like, but you, you have to do this. Like, I don't know what else to tell you. Like, this is the law. And so I want to dig into that a little bit, really with talking about employees versus contractors. And we've done a couple of episodes on it, but so that you guys know, I actually, I'm not even sure how I came across your content, Kira. It, <laughs> it must've been like a reel that showed up on my for you page or something. I was obsessed and I immediately was like, I, I went to your page. So you guys, this is how social media works, right? Like I, <laughs> I got served a piece of content. I went to her page. I started looking through all her stuff. I was like, this chick is legit. Like she knows what she's talking about and Aww. I have to have her on my show. And I immediately reached out and was like, will you come on my show to talk about this? So I, I want to talk about employees versus contractors, but I want to really talk about more of the why behind it. And I think some of those are not so fun and some of them can be like, no, but this can help you. So tell me a little bit more about like the mindset shift, the the why behind employees versus contractors. Yeah, I love that we're starting there because I mean, we can yap all day about the laws right. and, and there was a law that recently changed. So if this is brand new information to you, it was something that has been in... You know, in my industry, it's been kind of bounced around with a little bit of gray area, not a lot of clarity for the past four or five years, especially since the remote work, Mm -hmm. multi-state teams, you know, all of that kind of pushed this into being settled. And we had a final ruling passed from the Department of Labor in March. So I just want to like remove the shame from it. And if you haven't been a business owner for a while and this is feeling really new to you, it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. Like we are required to know this. So there's no excuse for that. Um, You will be held to the same standards regardless. I'll say the things that Brandy has been banging her head against (laughs) the wall trying to say to some of you. Um, But it also isn't necessarily something to feel ashamed about Mm -hmm. if you maybe haven't been doing it right for a while. 
while. So I love that you're talking about the mindset piece because one of the key components of employees versus contractors is control. And that can be a word that holds a lot of negative connotation, but what it does give you is so much power and so much responsibility to make an impact not only with your clients, but also within your team. Creating jobs for people that are going to treat them well, that you're going to create expectations that are going to allow them to make a difference, that are going to allow them to show up for your clients and your brides and your grooms. Like being able to control that experience of your team is actually maybe one of the bigger impacts you make. Your clients might talk about you in five, six, seven, 10, 20 years as a wedding planner or photographer or whatever. I still refer my photographer after seven years. Like all of that good stuff is still happening. But I will guarantee you that your employees will talk about you until they're old. They're going to tell stories about their bosses. They're going to talk about the leadership they received. They're going to understand that when you have a good leader, you get to set the standard for what it's like to be at work. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about control, we're not talking about it in a negative way, although it does give you a lot of power. You get to set the budget. You get to set the schedule. You get to really build a business that works for you. And there are so many people that are looking for opportunities. You're not actually ripping the rug out from somebody. You're creating an opportunity that somebody can seamlessly step in. And I think that that's a mindset shift that a lot of people might feel relieved to hear, Mm -hmm. Um, especially in the small business space, because everyone's content that we're seeing, like to your point, you're seeing other small business owners content. You are consuming content usually for your own business or to bring information to your clients like we like how we met or you know that's all the content we're seeing is a bunch of entrepreneurs but only eight percent of people identify as entrepreneurs 92 percent of people want a place to work that's going to help them pay the bills and they're happy to show up when you tell them to and they're happy for you to subvert some of their taxes so that they can get paid and, you know, count on a paycheck each week. So it can be more affordable. You can have a more smoothly run business. You can have more fun running your business and you don't have to be at the whim of the contractors you're hiring. And that's all just besides the fact that it's the law. (laughs) (laughs) That's all just besides the fact that like you are legally obligated to follow the law. Okay. So can you touch on for a second, the law that you said recently just changed in March? Can you touch on that? Yeah. So the Department of Labor, which is our federal government, essentially, um, they have pieces of legislation that we all have to follow. So they're kind of like the basis for HR compliance. And that may sound really boring and annoying, but they don't change that much. This is what's going to dictate our minimum wage or if we're allowed to pay people monthly or if we have to pay them within a certain salary range or, you know, all these things that really don't change that much. Mm -hmm. So for the Department of Labor to issue a final ruling, and they literally titled it that, Mm -hmm. on the definition of independent contractors, it was a big deal. And it brought forth six factors that we have to weigh in order to make sure that we're classifying our people correctly. And, you know, to your point earlier about the solopreneurship, I think that that is 100% it. Like there are going to be people where solopreneurship is the path that they want to take, but you also can give yourself permission to grow out of it. I just hate it when people get stuck in the, I'm just going to be a solopreneur because I don't want to deal with employees. Yes. It's like, we can't really decide. Your business is going to tell you what it needs. Don't be afraid to like say, oh, okay, my business is telling me I need an employee now. Time to go get the HR compliance sorted. Yes. Like that's not, it doesn't have to be emotional. It can literally be an exciting moment. Um, but on, you know, to your direct question, I think that that law really does lay it out very well. It gives you six different factors that you can review. We could yap about those things all day, but it really does come down to control, control of the rates, control of the behaviors, the skill set, when they're showing up, how they're showing up. Um, A really good example of this that is really relevant, especially for wedding pros, is if you're writing a job description, that's an employee across the board. Otherwise, you just say, hey, I need a social media manager who wants to pitch me. And then you go with their rates. You look at what you can afford. You see their work. You kind of measure their portfolio versus their rates. Figure out what works for you. Seamlessly fit into their processes. Solopreneurship survives another day. (laughs) Um, But many of us find gaps in that. We grow out of it. We want to be able to control the narrative of what our social media manager is doing or what our coordinators are doing or what our second shooters are doing. And in some states, it's impossible to even have a second shooter that isn't an employee. Um, and you know, in other States, it's a little bit more flexible. So it is just really important that everyone understands that that information is out there for you to seek out and look at. Um, but I think what everybody gets really shocked about is like contractors are easy, come easy, go, and they're not part of your team. They have their own business and the way to be a good business owner, support other business owners, Mm. hire female founders. That's a great way to run your business, but that doesn't mean you can have it both ways. Yes. A hundred percent. One of the things I try to explain to my students all the time is I'm like, I, you 
cannot expect them to make a commitment to you if you're not even committing to them to make them an employee. Like if you're just gonna Venmo them every Monday, there's zero commitment in that. You're not guaranteeing them a certain number of events or how they're gonna do things. You're not providing them equipment or training or any of this kind of stuff. Like why would you expect them to commit to you, right? They've gotta make a living as well. One of the things that you've talked about a lot is that power, that control, right? And (laughs) I always love it when a student says to me, um, well, it's okay. I don't really mind if if I don't have the control. And I'm like, well, but you're telling them what to wear and what time to come and how to do it. So that is some level of control. But one of the things that keeps coming up over and over in our group is this non-compete, that the non-compete doesn't exist anymore, which honestly was a lot of the reason why some of them would say like, okay, I'm going to do an employee because I can have this non-compete. I know that this is a question that's going to come up in listening to you. So can you touch on that a little bit of, you know, now that that's not possible. I guess I'm kind of leaning into that power topic that you brought up. I, mean, I, I totally get what you're what, where you're coming from. There's and I get this question a lot too and it's not that nuanced. Mm-hmm. Like at the end of the day, like a non-compete is let's just zoom out away from our businesses for a second. A non-compete is really harmful for people. Yeah. <laughs> like you can listen to any Gretchen Carlson interview, you know, those things can keep people in really toxic, abusive situations Mm -hmm. because if they leave, they literally can't make money. So what I like to do is kind of spin it on its head a little bit and say that your business is going to be totally fine whether your employee decides to move on and go somewhere else. We do not own our employees or our contractors. So a non-compete really isn't going to make that big of a difference. Although, side note, I do want to say that the HR community as a whole and a lot of employment lawyers are still debating over whether or not non-competes are in Forcible, they're actually still being, there's still legislation going on. They're literally litigating it right now. Depending on when this episode comes out, we might have another final ruling regarding that. But mostly, like, people are like, yeah, they're going to be illegal. In many states, they already have been non enforceable. It's not really that, it's not like huge news and it kind of doesn't matter. And I mean, I hate to be the bearer of bad news because. I think our our processes and our services have been extremely innovative in the HR industry. And I'm really scared to bring people in that may want to start their own business mm-hmm. or go off and be a consultant or take our ideas with them or, you know, even to collaborate with other HR people. Like, it's all a lot of fear. And I want to acknowledge that. But at the same point, like, my job as an employer isn't to prevent anyone else from having a successful life. My job as an employer and an entrepreneur is to do it the best possible way and to arm myself with the best possible people that are going to help me get there. And those people aren't always going to be the exact same people. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, it's your job to create a space where people are going to be excited to work for you. They're where they're going to be excited to grow with you, where you're going to have a strategic plan to keep them engaged. Your job is to be a good leader, to be a good manager, to keep them around for as long as, as possible until it's time for them to go do something bigger and better. What we don't want to do is create toxic work environments where people are going to job hop from competitor to competitor because you suck as a leader. Like you actually (laughs) do have control over how you're treating people and how you're training people and how you're developing them. And they will stay with you. People don't want to hop around. Employees want to stay where they're cared for and given this attention and given the opportunity to grow. And having those conversations really does come down to leadership at the end of the day. And I know it sounds really like like intangible, but this is what HR does. Like we literally help create cultures. We help create policies that are beneficial to both parties, the workers and the business owner. Mm -hmm. And a non-compete isn't going to prevent somebody from leaving and, you know, doing something else. An NDA might help a little though. And those are still legal. So we always (laughs) recommend those. (laughs) Yes. We have talked about NDAs on this show too, because you're right. It's, it's so, so helpful. And I think, you know, I have so many thoughts on a non-compete. We, we had one for years in our contract. It was very, very loose, very loose, because I really just kind of was like, I really just don't want you to be able to take my clients and go n- literally five minutes later and create your own company, but everything yeah. else is free game. Now we can't have them at all. And But to be honest, I've had planners that have quit my business and said, I really would like to start my own business and I, I would like your blessing. I know I have a non-compete. None of them have succeeded in it, and I don't say that in – you know, I wish them all well, but no one is you. And so even if somebody mm-hmm. were to go and start their own business that's competing with you, no one is you. And so if you've built up that brand, mm-hmm. that really strong brand, you wish them well. And, you know, more power to you. Wish them well. Hopefully they didn't do anything yeah. dirty. 
on the way out. But, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, I agree with you. I think a non-compete's only as good as you're going to enforce it anyway. And, you know, in our industry, the Haley Page situation was one of those oh my gosh. negative situations that you're talking yes. about where it was like, a non-compete was written in such a way that someone literally lost their name and their livelihood, which is kind of unreal, honestly, that anything like that yeah, could even exist. Right, right. And I think there's, you know, not to interrupt, but also we do have some control over this. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not just like, whatever, I guess we'll see what happens. Like, the way that you hire, the way that you recruit, mm-hmm. the way that you interview, the way that you bring people in, the way you develop them, the conversations you have with them, like creating loyalty is not something that you can check off a list. Like, yeah. it really does speak to not only the HR strategy of getting the right candidates in the right seats, but also there's a little bit of leadership there that keeps people excited about being with you. Yeah. And like I said, if you're hiring well and, you know, I'm not saying that if you hire people that yeah. go off and start their own businesses, that's a bad thing. But if it's something that's really important to you, like it is to me, that's part of my interview process. Mm-hmm. And I have employees that have worked for me for 11 years, 10 years, eight years, like my my paradigm employee has been with me from six months after I started the business. And like, I literally asked her, she was like, I, this is the perfect job for me. This is where I want to work. And I was like, do you want to start your own business? Because I'm building something weird here in the yeah. HR field. And she was like, I'm consulting for a couple of businesses, but I'll happily drop them. I don't want to have my own business. I want to work for someone else. I want to focus on leadership in HR. Like, this is what I want to do. And I don't, that made her even more appealing to me. Literally, I am just kind of like, yeah, I mean, come in. I'm going to train you well. We're going to have a great time. I hope you stay for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, I'll wish you well. And that's great too. I love this conversation. I, I can like picture in my head certain students of mine and listeners that I know listen to the show loyally. And I know they're like sitting on the fence like, okay, Kira, I get it. Like, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm starting to understand. I, I do want to talk a little bit about the legalities of it because you and I talked before and you were like, I could scare people if you want me to, but you know, that's not <laughs> always the best way. And so, but I, I do want to touch on that because You know, I literally just had a conversation with a student recently, a a very high performing student, and I'm helping her move all of her contractors to employees because that's the law. And, you know, as happens many, many times when we're going through this, she keeps pushing back at me. But why do I have to do this? Why can't I just keep Venmoing everybody on Monday? Why can't I, you know, and in addition to the fact that you can't grow a sustainable business by having a bunch of random contractors that go out and work for you every weekend, the legality of it, I love how you said it earlier before the show. So I'm going to turn this over to you. But like, I literally am just like, I don't even know what else to say anymore, except it's just the law. Like, (laughs) it's just the law. So can you talk a little bit about the law and maybe a little bit of the scare tactic of what you've seen happen? Yeah, I think before we started recording, we were sort of touching on how much my sales process, lead generation process has developed over the years. And I'm really open about all of this. Like, I think that especially as women in business, creative, small business owners, we have to be able to be open and transparent Mm -hmm. with each other to the extent that it's professional. (laughs) And I've had to change a lot about the way that I'm talking about my services because it used to be, and I'm talking like 2021, early 2022, where people would come and be like, come to my, you know, whatever, like a live or yeah. they'd request information or they'd fill out the inquiry form. And I, they'd be like, I've been following forever. I'm finally ready to make the leap. I'm so excited about my growth. I can't wait for you to get your eyes in my business so I could figure out how I'm going to get there, making money and having a team and growing. And it's so exciting. And then I would say maybe towards the end of 2022, and then especially into this year, the inquiry process has not been that fun because a lot of it is people that are getting in trouble. And they're literally like, well, I need an HR company to come in and help me do my due diligence so I can decrease my penalties. The largest penalty I've heard of that is what for a small business around 11 employees was around one hundred and eighty thousand wow. um, dollars. They say the average is and, and that's that's the highest. And I've talked to a lot of people. So don't like, you know, totally <laughs> freak out. I'm like, imagine. please keep listening. Um, <laughs> but the, the mid range, they usually say is somewhere between 40 and 45 thousand for misclassification. It is by far the biggest risk that your business can take with the exception of being sued by a client or something like that. 40 and to 45,000 though is b- 
business crushing for a small oh, business. Oh, truly, truly it is. And I, 100%, I mean, it would crush, it would crush my business. 100%. So at the end of the day, our conversations went from, this is so fun, we're going to see so much growth, our client results are going to be so great, to the point where we started a recruiting department in our business to help okay. people grow and find the right people. And now it's more, oh crap, I have to do this, I'm bummed about it, it sucks. And then after a couple weeks, it's like, holy crap, this is going to absolutely transform my profit margins. Now I understand compliance. Now yeah. I understand I don't have to have these conversations over and over again about PTO. Now I understand I don't have to resent my team. You know, like there is that transition, but the initial conversation is like, you know, I have this huge fine I have to pay and I have to show that I'm doing it right. And they don't, I think people don't realize that that is true. Those penalties are real. They, people are not talking about them because why would they? I mean, in the interest of transparency, sure. nobody wants to be like, I've been exploiting people. You know, like <laughs> that's not, because that is what it is. You know, like no one wants to be like, oh crap, I have to, you know, go solo for a while because I literally exploited people. I have a huge loan to pay off or I'm on a big payment plan with the state or the IRS stuff like that. Yeah. Those misclassification fines are not a joke. And that has really sucked because before it was like, we're all growing and it's so great. And it's so fun. And now it's like, I hate that I have to do this. Mm-hmm. And it takes a little bit for people to really get bought into that strategic side of the people operations and HR. And, you know, like when you have people coming into your business, like they are meant to make you money. So if they do leave, it's okay because you strategically created a plan for you to make ROI on them yeah. and also have like, fun and like have a fun business and have fun team meetings and talk about Love Island or whatever. That's right. Um, yeah. Create a yeah, company so, culture, right? Yeah. Can, can I touch on the exploiting people for a second? Because I <laughs> totally get you, but I want you to, t- I want you to dig into that a little bit because I would say, you know, most, uh, if, at least from the experience working with wedding pros, right? I, I really exclusively work with the wedding industry. Um, business mm-hmm. owners, they would be confused by that because they're thinking, mm-hmm. oh, but no, I'm paying them more because I'm literally just Venmoing them or I'm literally right. just, you know, depositing money into their account. But if I put them as an employee, then they they get charged taxes and I have to pay taxes. And so touch on that a little bit. I also want to ask you, so I'm, I'm going to put both questions out there because we're talking kind of about this law and the exploiting people and how you're getting audited. Also, how are people even getting audited? Yeah, for sure. So I think that when we talk, what we don't realize as business owners is that employees are classified as employees because they get protections. So especially in the wedding industry, this is really big because what kind of kicked all of this off was in 2020, COVID happened. I'm here, I'm in California, so we have the worst of everything um, <laughs> and and the best, by the way. Um, but there's- I'm in Florida, so we couldn't be more polar opposite. Yes, yes. And yeah. basically, like, in 2020, all these people were – we had an extra benefit for unemployment. So people were getting paid pretty near to their salaries, usually, if they were getting able to get unemployment. But mm-hmm. only – W-4 employees get unemployment, not 1099s. Okay. They also, we also don't pay into Social Security for 1099s. It's our responsibility as business owners to handle that for ourselves. Um, and there's other additional benefits as well that come out in our taxes, and they all just look like acronyms, and I'll let the accountants talk about that, because um, we barely hold hands on the accountant side for when it comes to all of those things, but we do know that we are going to have to essentially pay a little bit more for an employee than their hourly rate. It's still usually less than a contractor, by the way. That all comes down to this factor that exploiting people is not really about how you're treating them or, you know, making them feel bad or not paying them or whatever. It's literally about the built-in protections that come with the classification of employment. So when Mm. those people were classified incorrectly and then they go to apply for unemployment, they didn't get any benefits. So when this industry, when the entire restaurant industry or the wedding industry or, you know, other the salon and beauty industry all shuts down unless they were classified correctly. They were literally shit out of luck. And Mm. that sucks because a lot of people got additional benefits as employees because they were classified correctly that helped them get through this time period. And then eventually Mm -hmm. businesses were also granted PPP loans, which they were also supposed to be passing off to their employees, not their contractors. Mm -hmm. Us as contractors, us as business owners are required to handle that stuff on our own. We have decided that we are independent and we can figure out how to make money and we are taking responsibility for the way that our economic situation looks. So what's actually happening is it's not we're taking other business owners or 
you know, kind of coming up with this relationship that's going to be mutually beneficial. When we say exploiting people, it's because many people don't understand that. And it's our Mm. job as business owners or the person that's paying, the person in power, the person in authority to ensure that we are doing what's right by the people. So think about like maybe a second shooter that you hired that's 18 years old that doesn't even know that they're filling out a W-9 versus a W-2. I mean, I hire people constantly that I'm like, I can't help you with your tax form but I'm going to wait right here while you call your mom. You know, like I'm literally like, go ahead and call mom. Like that is totally fine. Like I get it. It really is the business's job to make sure that we are protecting the people that we're hiring Mm -hmm. and that they are getting the allotted benefits that maybe they don't even realize that they have. So in some states, there's disability. If they get hurt, there's Um, Like here in California, you get paid for maternity leave. If you, from the state, your small business doesn't even have to pay for it. Um, Things like that, that come with that classification as an employee that as a 1099, we don't always get those benefits. And so when I say exploiting people, it's not just about how you treat them. It's also setting them up for financial success and also making sure that your business isn't going to have to pay them whether they're working or not. That is literally what the system is built for, for the business to be successful and not have the business have to take a hit if you do have have to lay someone off. You know, we do have unemployment Mm -hmm. insurance and things like that, but that's all in place for a reason. It's why it costs a little bit more on top of your employee salaries to pay them. But if you are doing business in a strategic way and you have HR support, you can build job descriptions that are actually going to be more affordable for your business to run with a higher ROI because you have that control. So that all goes back to that control. Um, The second part of your question, a lot of times there will be a contractor that was a full-time contractor, which does not Mm. exist, like put it on a, put it on my (laughs) grave. Um, But essentially they have a contractor that's like, oh, you're letting me go. So I'm going to go and apply for unemployment. And then the business essentially gets audited and then they go through their history of uh, usually retainer contractors are the ones that will pop up big time, high volume um, payments towards an individual, things like that will be things that pop up depending on the state that you're in. There's also a possibility that you're going to get misclassified or you're going to have classification documents from the federal government, the IRS, like legally the federal government, the monetarily the IRS or from your state. And what we've seen is it's a lot more state classification um, and the education that we do. So my whole company is basically like we're focused on figuring out what's going on with compliance in all 50 states so that you don't have to because we have to sift through a lot of information. And what we have been told time and time again is small businesses are low hanging fruit. If a, mm-hmm. It's literally like, you know, when people used to tell you stories about like cops having to have a quota, like I don't know if that's real yes. or not. Like my brother-in-law is a, <laughs> a cop and he says no, but I, don't know. Um, but I know it's like a secret society. They're not allowed to tell anyone, but yeah. it's totally true. I know. I'm like, <laughs> okay, Andy. There's a bunch of different ways that you can get caught. And primarily it's it's sometimes unintentional, but the biggest mm. thing that I've seen is people are like, well, they, they want to be a contractor. So like, I, there's nothing I can do about it. If they want to be a contractor, the first thing that you're going to do is have them scope the work for you and send you a contract. The next thing you're going to do is pay them through their business. From there, Mm -hmm. some of those red flags are not going to pop up because, like I was kind of saying, this small businesses are low-hanging fruit. Like, literally, states are like, hey, go out and find some small businesses that we can go find Mm -hmm. for this because it's now they've had enough time to figure it out. Like, it's time for them to pay penalties. This is all in the best interest of workers. It is literally for workers' rights. It's creating a really equitable environment for people to work, and it's also creating a really amazing environment for freelancers with great boundaries to thrive. So at the end of the day, it's a good thing. But there's a few, you know, I would say – I've heard of a few different ways people are getting caught. Usually it's accidental, but a lot of it is just a history of, you know, payments or, you know, paying individuals on a consistent basis. The if they're mm-hmm. if they're picking it up on their taxes, the whole Venmo thing. Now there's AI combing through this research yes. and information. So it's really not something to mess with. Yeah, I think that's what's interesting about it. I think you literally just hit the nail on the head is that the biggest reason that people don't hire employees is because they they're so fearful of how to do it from Mm -hmm. the beginning and so then it's like this big scary beast and then once you do one you're like oh that's (laughs) it like I'll just make everybody an employee then and I'm like yes this is the point right so but I think that that's interesting how people are getting audited because the reason I asked was because I think a lot of business owners think well as long as I'm nice to everybody that works for me it's like they're not going to go tattle right well one you don't actually know how our relationship will end and two 
really just those repeated payments over and over to the same people or they're going to have to claim it on their taxes at some point. Like those are red flags that the IRS picks up on Mm -hmm. and um, that can cause an audit real quick. And I don't even care if it's $5,000. Like $5,000 to, you know, some businesses would, well, it would suck no matter what, right? Like $5,000, I don't want to pay any more to the government than I have to. Right, right. Certainly not. for. And then you have to hire us and that's... Right. (laughs) And that's Get a all thing. In compliance. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. And you're going to have to make everybody an employee eventually. So, yeah. So I love this episode so much. Kira, tell us a little bit more about where people can connect with you and your company and learn more about working with you. If somebody's listening and they're like, yeah, I really want to get my stuff in order. I want to have this sorted. The way that Paradigm works is we have this thing called the Paradigm Solution. And it's a 90-day program that addresses compliance, your people operations, so those job descriptions, making sure you're getting an ROI on people, calculating your labor margins, Mm -hmm. getting a payroll system set up that makes a lot of sense so that you can sleep at night. You're not going to get in trouble for, you know, all those things that come up. Um, And then your culture as well. If you know that you want to hop on a call, whether you're reluctantly excited about HR or not, you can just go to our website, fill out our contact form, and you'll be sent a scheduler. Make sure that you said Brandy sent you as well. I'm sure it usually comes up in our conversations. Um, And yeah, just kind of let me know what's going on so I can bring something for you to the call. There's usually somebody's like, oh, I have an employee or somebody I need to switch over in Nevada. Like it could be something really simple. Like, is there anything that I need to know. Sometimes it's all about like getting a maternity policy, like just really like dive into that inquiry and let me know what I can help you with. So if I have to do any research, I can. Um, And we usually do a 30 minute consultation. And then from there, figure out what the best fit is for you budget wise and how to move forward and things like that. So you can do that on our website, but you can also send me a voice memo. I know there are a lot of businesses out there that have social media managers and people monitoring their DMs. I am the only one in my DM. So don't be afraid to tell me if something's going on. I'm not going to report you to the IRS. I get a lot of private confidential information in a voice memo and Instagram DMs. So don't be afraid to reach out. It really is me in there. And I'm truly here to just kind of bridge that gap between the corporate HR stuff and how we can benefit as small business owners. Okay, you guys, well, we're going to link all of Kira's information in the show notes. So make sure you go give her a follow. Tell her you heard her on the show. (laughs) And if this is something that you need help with, reach out so that you can get your HR in line because we do not need you getting audited. We do not. If you do get audited, we want it to be clean, green check, right? Mm -hmm. Like we want it to be nice and squeaky clean. Kira, thank you so much for being on the show. This was an awesome episode. Thank you for having me.